Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Breaking Absolutes. I'm here today uh, with Jordan Rudess of Dream Theater. Uh, Jordan and I have been friends a long time, so there's going to be um, some fun personal stories, and I will try and get inside the, the head of a man who is uh, far more than just uh, the amazing uh, keyboard player for Dream Theater, um, in keeping with the idea of uh, my show here, Breaking Absolutes, which is to uh, dimensionalize these players and these musicians that work inside rock and metal um, to kind of extrapolate, hopefully, to a larger audience. Um, so with that said, let me just kind of set up a little bit about Jordan. Uh, many of you I know are, are Dream Theater fans, so this may be uh, known uh, to you, uh, but let me kind of do this just to establish his bona fides. Um, Jordan uh, has, if you go on the internet, um, there are many different sort of uh, music outlets in rock and metal that will pull readers for you know, favorites and best ofs. And Jordan in the keyboard category makes all of these lists. Um, one in particular on Music Radar voted him um, uh, not too uh, many years ago as the best keyboardist of all time. Um, he's twice nominated for a Grammy with Dream Theater. Um, he entered the Juilliard School of Music pre-college division uh, for classical piano training at the age of nine. Um, he was voted Best New Talent in 1994 by Keyboard Magazine, uh, the reader's poll, after his Listen Solo album came out, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, he's launched a successful app company called Wisdom Music. Um, we'll talk um, some about that later, but Morph Wiz, one of those, was um, the first ever Billboard Award for Best Music Creation App. Um, he's presented for Microsoft. Um, he's presented for uh, Apple at the developer conferences. Um, gosh, there's so much more to say, but I want to spend some time actually talking with Jordan um, versus just all of these, these uh, bon mots. Suffice to say, um, Jordan has taken his music and really created ways for, for other musicians uh, to build on what he knows and what he does so well. So without any further ado, let me bring on... Jordan Rudess. Jordan, welcome. All right, here we are. Very cool. Here we are. So thank. I'm so <laughs> grateful to you for joining. This is awesome. Oh, uh, when I heard you were doing this, it looked really cool, and I was just excited to be a uh, part of your uh, new adventure. Yeah, it is a new adventure, and I've had uh, such good support by friends. And you and I have been friends a while. I wanted to uh, tell the story of real quickly the first time we met. Um, yeah. I think we had exchanged some email, but I, uh, you got me a pass to a show when you were coming through town in, in Seattle and I came in while you were, it was, um, before the show and you were on stage and you were, you were running some stuff with John. You guys were just doing these crazy, crazy, you know, parts and you were <laughs> sight the, the, I mean, what you can do, but you were sight reading it. I, and I'd never seen someone do something so intricate. Yeah, in the context of, uh, uh, you know, live, yeah, it, was, it really blew my mind. And then, you know, you came and you brought, and then you brought me up and you showed me your rig. Uh, and I want to talk more about, you know, your technology setup later. But it just kind of gave me this sort of dual sense of who you are, this, this such proficiency with, with musicianship. And then just absolutely eager just to share with me, like, all of the, the fun toys that you use to bring it all to life. It was a really, it was a fun moment for me. Um, That's awesome. So anyway, then and then from there, you know, I've uh, you know traded email and and dinners here and there over the years. Um, I want to go. Uh, and by the way, I guess before we get going, inside these crazy times, how are you? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty good. I've got a, my brain is like spinning with all the different stuff that's going on. There's a lot of moving parts, you know, with Dream Theater certainly. Um, getting ready to do some solo piano shows. So I'm at the piano practicing Bach and Chopin and LTE yeah. three arrangements that I want to do. And, you know, all this stuff I'm thinking my, my head is also spinning with NFR information because everybody and their mother is telling me about NF NFTs, sorry, NFTs, yeah. NFTs and NFRs and all the NFs. They're all, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of NFs in my life, but uh, yeah. And it's just, it's some exciting stuff. It's amazing. I even get to sleep, but, uh, but I try to do that so I can refresh and think about all these things again the next day. Yeah, I, in fact, all the things you mentioned, um, I've done a bunch of poking around um, recently, and I'm going to ask you about all of that because I want to get all mm -hmm. the details on these various, you know, efforts and creative endeavors you've got going. 
Um, cool. But before we we come to the present, let's go into the past a little bit. Um, there's some fun things out of out of your bio that I just want a little color on Jordan as a young person <laughs> on. You tell sure. this story about um, your early Hungarian teacher and that she had a strong temper and would occasionally kick you if you played the wrong note. Was this playful or was it just was it just just enough that you're like, yeah, I better get it right next time? Oh yeah. She was she was serious. She was she was very loving. She was a Hungarian temperamental woman. She uh um was living through the the fact that her son was a Juilliard student and actually went into the from the pre-college to the college level. And then some point along the way, even further along than I got in the college level, he decided to join Guy Lombardo's band. Oh, wow. Guy Lombardo, of course, was the, uh, you know, old Lang Syne guy at midnight. And it kind of blew her mind and she never recovered. And when she met me, she thought, okay, this one, this one's <laughs> going to do the, the correct path. And she got me really ready to go to Juilliard very quickly. It was about a year of studying with her, a year of intense lessons. Uh, she was determined that I'd get in and, you know, she taught me the Bach and the Beethoven and the Chopin or whatever it was in those days to prepare for the rounded set. And uh, and I got in. But of course, um, I guess, you know, many, maybe in some ways it was good that she passed away before I made the big transition to being, uh, you know, a synthesist and a prog metal guy. Well, that that's a perfect segue because the very next question I wanted to ask you, because you talk about how you started to hear this other music and it just started to pull at you. And, and I, you've talked a lot about um, influences, so I don't want to go there. What I'd really be interested to know, though, is um, the conversation you have with your parents, who I think, if I if I remember reading, like they, they, I guess they were still kind of hoping you'd pursue this path. And as a, as a parent, I think without any context and certainly the passion that is inside you, they're thinking concert pianist versus rock and roll guy. And so like, you know, how did that conversation go? Was it, was it like, son, you're not doing this? Or was it like, understand, help us understand why you need to go and, and depart on this path? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. It leads to, uh, it leads to a lot, probably more than I can even express in the context of our call, but basically let's look at it this way. So I was a very focused straight and I guess in some ways narrow kid just doing the Juilliard thing in some ways even regular school wasn't like a big part of my life either my mother was very uh she wasn't like a stage mother but she was really she loved the fact that I was doing what I was doing and she was very um very she was very supportive of it so anyway so and she would drive me to julia you know the pre-college you go and you drive in every saturdays and then i'd have an extra lesson on tuesdays and with my teacher and then somebody come to the house so it was pretty full with stuff of course the college level of juilliard is different and it's an everyday thing but um so i was following my path and you know around 17 years old or so people started to turn me on to all these different kinds of things uh, different kinds of music, LSD, a lot of influences that kind of came into my life all at once. And I never had a, I never had the typical kind of uh, teenage rebellion. I didn't rebel at all. I was happy with where I was and I was just doing it. And I guess to this day, I never really had a teenage rebellion, but I did discover a lot once I turned the knobs of the Moog and heard Tarkas and the other influences. Um, and so I really, at that point, the way that I broke free was very independent. I didn't care what anybody else said. Mm -hmm. Nothing was up for discussion. I had to break free. I was, I would, I, you have to picture me as a kid. And I, you know, I wasn't allowed to go into my, my local town until I was like 17 or 18 years old. I was very protected. Uh. I would just, you know, get up and, you know, Hey mom, I feel a little something in my throat. Oh, stay home and practice, you know, and like, you know, just in my little world. So when it finally came time for me to kind of make a shift, I just did it. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't a talk. It wasn't like, you know, mom and dad, let's talk about this. I know that you put a lot of time into it. It was like, fuck it. Um, this is what I'm, you know, it, yeah. what I'm doing. And I didn't even mean for it to be like that. It wasn't necessarily with that attitude, but I did, bro I just kind of like broke away. You just made a and decision. They were no longer like an influence uh, in my, in my path yeah. for, you know, yeah. for good or bad. I mean, everything did work out, but there were some strange years there, you know, with that kind of a big move. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's that's great. Um, I, you know, you're you're always have struck me as a person who marches to his own drummer. You know, that's a tired 
a metaphor, but it's true. It's true with you. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I read about uh, and I've I've learned about you as a musician is your uh, amazing improvisational skills. And you you made this comment, which I found kind of it, it just uh, slipped in there in in uh, a bio, but I found it made me pause. You, you said it is important to learn to improvise. I think that is what music is all about. So I wanted you, I, I wanted you just if you would take a second and just extrapolate on that. Um, what do you mean when you say that? Well, I have a very um, close, deep connection with improvisation. I really do feel like of all the things that I do as a musician, it's probably the most important skill, at least important to me in the way I feel and the way that I express and the way that I compose. So like in my mind, improvisation feels, like, when I sit down at a piano or a synthesizer, it feels very much like talking. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine being at an instrument and having the same fluidity that you do, like picking up a guitar or a keyboard, as you do when you just kind of come, I mean, you're like amazing with words and they just flow and you're improvising. You don't have a script, you're just right. going with it. And these beautiful words and thoughts are coming out of your mind and then your mouth. Well, I kind of feel like that whole kind of similar method is what I've been developing my whole life and what I kind of naturally got into, even though it wasn't really supported at Juilliard per se, it's what I've always been about. It's about having the musical thoughts, the emotions, and being able to get those through my fingers in real time. And that's why, you know, I can sit down at a piano and basically any time of day or night and just play stuff you've never heard before. And if it's a good day, you might be like, hey, what's that? And I'll be like, I don't know, you know, just play. I'm just playing. Yeah. Like what's the, in a way, what's the, if, if it's, you know, a good day, what's the difference between that and the stuff I write for Dream Theater Liquid Tension? There is no difference because it's the stuff that comes out of my head, you know? It might be that we, you know, I'm sitting in a room with John Petrucci, who's an incredible musician, guitar player. He might say, you know, Jordan, let's think of a different chord than that. Maybe we used that one before. Or like, you know, there might be like some of those kind of like decision making things that could influence the way it goes. And there often are things like that. But, there's another part of the reality, which is this, this kind of flow of music that comes out is very much integral to the way that I work. And it becomes part of everything that I do, both in the compositional world, but also when I'm improvising. It's one of the reasons that I am comfortable doing like my uh, Patreon you know, streams, like just turning on the camera and playing and I can do one, yeah. you know, one or two every week because I'm just making it up. I'm just playing, you know, an idea comes in my head, I play. So that whole, like that whole fluidity, that development, that whole process, I think is a really beautiful thing about someone making music. And granted, you can make music in many other ways. I mean, you can sure. learn, you can look at a score, you can interpret it, you can play it very beautifully and that's making music. I'm not taking away anything from that. But uh, of all the skills that I do have, having been a classical music student and kind of gone on that route and then gone to rock and kind of putting it all together, I value the improvisational headspace and ability and growth element probably more than anything else that I do. Yeah, you know, there was a, a stream, uh, something that you did from um, DTHQ during the writing uh, period of the, the most recent record. And I heard John make the comment and he was kind of giving you one of those fun elbows kind of thing. Um, Cause he was and expressing some jealousy around the fact that you can so with such um, um, ability, write solos, just, just improv solos that are just amazing. So I, I when, my question there is like when you're uh, in the, other, other than when maybe you you and John are trying to, to double something is a lot yeah. of how you write, like it's just coming to you, at, you know, it, um, it's an improvisation and then you find something you love or, I mean, because mm -hmm. the, the, your solos have this, this um, sp uh, quality of spontaneity that isn't often found in solos that I really adore. Oh, that's so nice to hear. You know, John and I talk about it a lot because first of all, John Petrucci, you know, I, I just can't, you know, working with him all these years, I can't say enough wonderful things about the man because when he plays a solo, his architecture is just so, his tone and the, this, the shape of his solos, you can't beat that. It's incredible, yeah. right? Yeah. And that being said, like I, you know, I, when I approach my solos, 
they, they kind of come from a different spot, but I'm saying this with all respect to what he does. I would never want to replace what he does. Matter of fact, maybe I, it would be cool if I could do what he does, but everybody can do something, you know, different. But I, I go with, with a solo, especially, I go with this emotion a lot. I, I can't, if I'm just constructing the solo, I can't tap into the emotion. I'm going for, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were saying, who is the musician that you would want to play with dead or alive? You know, that kind of question. I said, you know what? It's probably like Jim, Jimi Hendrix. And they said, why? Because they expected me to say like a keyboard player or something like that. I was saying, because Hendrix was the master of cool. The guy was yeah. just dripping. The guy, you know, a lot of, you know, most guitar players can play like better than Jimi Hendrix these days because the art of play, playing the guitar has evolved. But Hendrix was dripping with coolness. The LSD was literally <laughs> like pouring off of him, whatever, you know, whatever it was. It was just he was missed the coolest. Yeah. And I think about him when I'm when I'm kind of in that rock solo space that I just want to embody that. And it's just an emotion. It's just a feeling. And I just want to play and get there like obviously i'll be playing you know more notes than that and virtuosic phrases but that element of coolness is really important to me and the way that i get that is very much kind of like just go for it like a lot of times if i go for a solo if I, granted if i understand the you know harmonies and the rhythms that are behind it sometimes sure. it takes a little longer but if i get it and i can just go for it and get the emotion and the feeling that's the most important thing to me mm -hmm. and often not to sound, I don't mean this to come out egotistical, I really don't, but often it'll happen on the first take. And then if it doesn't, that's when trouble happens. Cause then I start to overthink it. And then it's like, um, oh, maybe this, maybe that. But you know, all that being said, I will say that on the newest, uh, the latest Dream Theater album, which of course is going to be really hard to sit on, I took a little bit of a different approach. I did, I did that. I let it pour out, but then I was inspired by, um, my thinking about the way John does it, because I really love the way his solos are. And I was thinking, you know, I should try, I should do, a, I should try to get both, get this emotion, this energy, this spontaneity, but also a little more crafting. So I kind of, I think I found a really good balance. You guys will hear that when, obviously, when it comes yeah. out. But there's that, there's that element, there's the crafting as well. And I also worked with Jimmy T and with John on my sound. Even though, you know, I thought my, I think my signature lead sound is very cool. Uh, John had a concept about it that I really respected because, you know, the one person in the world I'll listen to when it comes to tone is him. Sure. Uh, so we kind of went for something a little bit more, a little bit uh, different, a little bit more like smoother, and but a little bit more like pointed and so uh, i'm excited about people hearing this new uh, this new approach i'm glad you asked me about that because it really it really you know is a is a thing yeah well i mean i'm i'm excited by what um what you've come up with for the new record uh, but for the record uh the the way you i think you've approached the solos in the past um they, they've always felt like they had a shape to me but um they also had this distinction of feeling spontaneous um which i and i'm going to talk more about the sort of um, whimsy and joy that I think you bring to the, the the band, but let's save that for the Dream Theater. I have a whole section on Dream Theater for later. Okay, but you cool, bring up cool. the you bring up the um, the lead thing. I read and I didn't know this. Uh, at least at one time, you had some sort of lead tone you called the pig. Am I, is I am I reading that right? Is that the different? pig is one of the. It's not a lead tone, but okay. it's one of the sounds I use generally to double the guitar and the okay, heavy. Okay, that's what it is. Okay, right. The snar it's called the snarling pig. The snarling pig. Is that still, you still use that? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. it's a dream theater staple. It's like, you know, it's like you play the electric guitar, I play the pig. You know, it's like <laughs> one of the one of the important sounds to the band. Okay, good. I, well, see, I didn't know that. So I'm learning too. It's just fun for me because yeah, yeah. uh, I've been a, I followed the band forever. Now you, um, know. You, you, you mentioned too, um, one of the things you'll do to, to practice is you'll, you'll pick a, a, a classical piece, sometimes a really challenging one. I'm wondering, is that still something you do? And if so, what have you played lately that's sort of pushed your limits? Good question. You know, one of the reasons that I'm a prog musician is because I'm also crazy uh, in the <laughs> sense that for some reason, I get some kind of weird joy out of torturing myself, you know, and, and when I was a kid, it was, you know, uh, my teacher would say, okay, learn this Hungarian Rhapsody. I'd be like, okay. And I'd like take it and I'd look at the notes and it would be like, what the hell does this even say? And I, you know, 
crash my hands down on the keyboard in frustration, but somehow manage to keep going. It's not like that for everything. Like this is music with me that I'll go through that process. Like I'm not like trying to build stuff and like trying and getting frustrated, but pushing through. I'm just like, I can't do that. But with music, you know, I'll take something that's really, really hard and I'll have the same kind of thing like, oh my God, nobody can do this. And then I'll keep working on it, keep trying to understand what the page says, what fingers to put on the notes and, you know, push through. So there's still a little bit of that in me. I, you know, part of me wants to go, you know what, don't even do that. Just relax and play, like improvise something really sweet and soft. And, you know, that's, that's easy and it's nice, but I don't know. I guess who I am involves this kind of uh, ability or madness to want to like challenge myself and do weird things. So, I mean, not that it's that, not that learning like a classical hard piece is that weird, but you know what I mean? Sure, I do. So, uh, since I'm doing these solo concerts, the first thing that I challenge myself to is not really a classical thing, but I thought, you know what? I'm going out, there's no concerts now, right? Like, really, there's not much to go out and see. So, I thought, would it be, it'd be really cool if I took some LTE3, some of the new stuff, and I made piano arrangements of oh, it? Oh, wow. So uh, I just worked on with my illustrious transcriber who helped me a lot, Jordan Baker, also another Jordan. And we uh, arranged um, uh, an arrangement of Key to the Imagination, a song off the new Liquid Tension album, yeah. which is a big, so, big band composition, you know, song, but I have a piano arrangement oh, of nice. it now that I'm going to play live. But it's a lot of coordinating of hands. But beyond that, in a classical sense, so now I decided to learn... Uh, Danielle, my wife, was listening the other day to Arthur Rubinstein playing really beautiful Chopin etude. And she said, oh, look at this. And I looked at it and somehow it just stayed with me. I was like, I want to learn that etude. So uh, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. That's one of the pieces. So I'm, so I'm arranging LTE3 stuff and I'm learning a Chopin etude. And it uh, should be an interesting evening. Yeah, I'll just be breathing very smoothly and calmly and, you know, just kind of <laughs> trying to do my thing. I do, um, while I'm thinking about it, because um, I want to talk about the, the dates you're doing, I, I believe I read that at least with some of them, you're going to try and stream them. Is that still a plan? Yeah, yeah, that is. There's certain venues. I can't rattle them off, but there's certain venues that will be streaming. It's on my website. Okay, we'll, say that we'll point people to that for sure. Yeah, that, yeah. cool. Um, one last thing before we start jumping into uh, some other topics. Um, I read that you do so, you, you've developed some sort of tabletop exercises. Oh yeah, um, well, sure. What is that? Like, I, I maybe because oh, I'm not a keyboard player. Like, what and how, yeah, how do you use yeah. that? Tabletop exercises because I really uh, find that it's important and really possible to practice your instrument away. You don't always need to be at your instrument to develop, to develop your technique. So it was just a seer, you know, it's like, a, I think on my online conservatory and certainly I talk about it on my Patreon, but you know, like putting your hand down like flat on a surface and kind of, it's good if you have some, somewhere to kind of almost like lean your arm down. So you're not up like this. I don't have it right now in front of me, but to get a decent position and then your fingers are kind of like, you know, in the right spot. And then I have different things that I do, like, you know, lifting up these two and then lifting up these two and then maybe doing a trill between these two or a trill between these two and interesting things to kind of get the in the independence going of your fingers really important stuff you know from a classical perspective the most typical one is to play like a you know a diminished chord or something and then say okay let me lift up this finger no they're gonna do that and the others stay down and lift this one and you try to get that one up higher even though it's harder with that yeah, finger yeah. you know and that and then you try to lift up two and then maybe you try to lift up three and then the two in the middle and the, you know all these things to kind of get your brain to send messages to your fingers so if you think of something you can play it yeah yeah Just, uh, even if i'm doing like a simple comping kind of thing like this little like what i call songwriter piano just playing like chords whatever a lot of times with the way I do it, certain notes hold and others don't. It's not just banging like the same chord in a rhythm or even going da 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 or one of those patterns. It's very much about a different kind of a, a, a an approach that does involve some finger independence, and I think it yields for a really attractive sound. Yeah, well, I, I mean, if uh, I've never heard of this before, I don't I don't live in and amongst keyboard players, but it's fascinating to me the whole concept of doing this kind of exercising away from the instrument. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to, I just wanted for, per, for selfish reasons, I wanted to see what that was. So thank you for demonstrating. Absolutely. Of course. Let's yeah. talk about Jordan, the technologist. Um, 
Sure. The first thing, the first thing I saw, and I, you know, I, I again, I don't know all of the the keyboard players on the planet, but you're the first person I, the first keyboard player I know, that in their setup for live shows would take and have like entire sort of libraries uh, that they wanted to use and mapping them across the keyboard and then set those in succession so that with a foot pedal you could change to new sets and and new sets for songs. Uh, how did you d devise the approach to do that so that you could, you know, so with such facility move between sounds during a set? Yeah, you're asking some really interesting questions. And I'm not just saying that because you're my friend, but you you're, you really are like, because these are interesting topics. And, and that one is really, really kind of a, a cool topic because, you know, progressive rock keyboard players, the, one that's, the ones that you know about, like the Rick Wakemans and the Emersons and people like or the Jeff Downs kind of players, you know, all great players. But their approach, you know, always was in having a keyboard here and one up here and one up here, one behind them and jumping around and, you know, all this kind of stuff. They wanted a clav sound. They'd move to this keyboard. They want a bell sound. They'll go here and then they go to the organ. And that's, you know, it's a whole thing. It's very showy and it's pretty cool. Sure. And that's what people know in the prog world. But my world was, I came into this in a different way. First of all, I came into this having a kind of Juilliard classical training uh, and then moving into this space and then getting into mini modes and spacey sounds and weird stuff. So I kind of have this other kind of like combination of influences jumping into it. And so there's that part of it. But the other part that kind of led me down this path to doing the kind of approach that you're talking about, which is using one key, one like large keyboard and making the world happen on that, is that um, when I was younger, uh, and I needed to get a job. I found a very cool gig working as a product specialist with Korg. Mm. Um, and when I started at Korg, I, I definitely was talented with synthesizers, but I didn't know what a lot of the technical words meant. There was a lot to fill in kind of with my knowledge, but working for Korg and being the guy who was doing demos and explaining the instruments to people, guys in music stores and clinics and all that filled in a lot of the blanks. But one of my responsibilities there was to take their instruments and to maximize them and to show them and really turn the world onto how cool these things were. You know, uh, with technology, often what happens, and I'm guilty of it too, to an extent, especially these days, if you look around my room, but, you know, there's so many different instruments, there's so many different gadgets, so many different things. We only have limited time and we generally don't go deep into any one particular thing. Like if you have a piece of software that does something on your computer that's cool, you might know something about it. You might know how to switch the patches, but do you really know everything that that thing will really do? Yeah. Chances are most people do not. I mean, I've worked with really high level engineers and they'll bring up a cool piece of software to do something and we'll get to a point where they do something and I'm like, well, what about this? And they, I, I don't really, you know, I don't use it for that or that's, you know, and then, then they're poking around like anybody else. But my job was to show how amazing these instruments were. And in those days, like starting with an instrument like the M1 Korg, I don't know if you remember that, but some yeah. of our listeners might. It was an instrument that was kind of like a workstation concept, had a lot of sounds in it. It was really, really cool. You could play piano, strings, bells, effects, all this kind of stuff it was the beginning of that. So I wrapped my head around that and I was like, oh my God, I can make this thing do everything that I really want. So that's what I did. That's the approach I took. And I, and I stayed in that approach and I liked it because it was my job, but I also liked it because from my point of view, musically, I didn't want to play a phrase on this keyboard and then da 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 and then jump and then lift up early, which is what you have to do when you go da 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 to me, it's more important to maintain the integrity of the musical phrase than it is to lift up early so you can get over to this other keyboard, right. especially if the one keyboard you're playing on will make all that will play all these sounds. Yeah. I, I so mean, it was an approach that I, that I started then for those reasons. It makes so much sense. Um, uh, I have to believe that that's been being emulated now. Um, but it, it, it well. Go ahead. Especially now that the now that the keyboards have even gotten you know better. I mean, the reality is on my Kronos, which is the main instrument that I use these days, I have sampled a lot of other instruments that you know the Kronos might ha might not have the sound of uh, some amazing orchestral library or some incredible synthesizer library. Well, 
I'm going to, I'm not bringing that software out with me. I'm going to put it inside the Kronos. I'm going to sample it. Yeah. We get up on the Kronos and layer it with something else. And then it's there. So for me, having it all kind of there in a focused place really, really works. I mean, there's still somebody could argue, well, if you play it actually on this instrument, it might sound better. I don't hear many people complaining when they come to a dream theater show that the sounds are not cool. I mean, I'm, I have a world of sounds there in my, in my Kronos and some of the, best like orchestral sounds there are because the ones I need I brought in there and right I tweaked in. myself and I know what velocity I want them at and I don't need to sample every velocity of an instrument to get it to do the job that I want so I that's, that's the approach that I take and every and one more thing I know I'm going on and on but the right. one thing that makes it really really cool these days is that after myself and some other keyboard players bugging these companies that when you change the patch these big layouts like strings, horns, effects, voices, and go to the next sound that's maybe like trombones and flutes and woodwinds, that there shouldn't be any interruption in the sound. All the reverbs, all the delays, everything should remain and there should be nothing that interrupts from one big light keyboard layout to another. And now that's the case. So I'm in a happy place with my, you know, rock and roll kind of like prog keyboard world because the instruments are so powerful these days. Yeah. Well, and everything that you just said um, really kind of uh, describes, I think, a, a, a approach, a process that you take that where you, you think of technology as this enabler of you as a musician. Um, I remember talking to you once about, uh, I think it was a run up to the astonishing. And I talked about, you know, you can look at a piece of hardware that's extraneous to you and maybe isn't class classically seen as an instrument and you, you talked about the ways of, of deriving expressiveness from it. Um, and I want to use that as a, as a transition to uh, wisdom music. You, uh, my count has you at um, 10 different apps now. Um, as, and, and with GeoShred being the most recent. Um, mm -hmm. What's next? Are you, is that, are you continuing to, to innovate there? Are you working with people on more apps? Are you just trying to, to iterate on the ones you have? Great question. I mean, so the answer is yes, I'm continuing to do that. I'm always inspired about like new instruments, new relationships, new cool ideas, new expression. Unfortunately, the, 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 the I guess, negative side of this world for me is I'm not the programmer. Mm -hmm. I'm like the vision kind of guy. I'm the musician. I know what I want to feel. I know what I want to see. I know what I, you know, what I want to touch. Um, but some of the relationships don't last forever and therefore sure. things change. Um, I will say, however, that the, my latest app, which you mentioned, which is called GeoShred, has been really very strong for a number of years right now. And I've got an extremely solid relationship and a solid team. So that app is one of these kind of like real musical instruments, if you will, that is just not going away. It's a yeah. deep thing. And it's, you know, it's becoming like a platform, uh, if you will. It comes out of a partnership with some guys that I uh, met uh, while doing work uh, at Stanford University. Matter of fact, one of the guys that's my partner, his name is Julius Smith, wonderful guy, professor there, one of the inventors of physical modeling. Oh. And his team, the Mo Forte guys, are an awesome bunch of guys that I love working with. And we have this amazing app and it's becoming like, you know, it's it's become a big deal. It has. So, yeah. yeah so that said, I mean, I, I'd be happy to show a little bit of that. But, but I also interested in you know what are the things what are the fun things can i do and i got a lot of irons in the fire you know okay. a, lot, a lot of cool stuff i just am talking to a guy we're going to be releasing a visualizer oh, application nice. very soon so it's a beautiful audio visualizer that does all these cool things when it receives you know microphone or line in signals or loading files into it i'm kind of jordanizing it now and we're going to release it soon. jordanizing we've yeah. got a verb that's cool People can st stay tuned for that. But also <laughs> my original concepts of MorphWiz and SampleWiz were very, very powerful. Yeah. Uh, and I'm working with teams to take those into the next level as well, pro versions of those. So, th so those are happening. It's exciting. There's, a lot, there's a, lot, a lot of cool stuff going on. And I'm always inspired by that space because it's, you know, the app space is just a very creative environment and, and, I, and I love it. Yeah, I know, uh, I do know some keyboard players that use um, GeoShred quite a bit. Um, that mm -hmm. one's, uh, that one, I don't know which of your, which is the sort of best selling, but I, that one cer certainly got, got a lot of traction uh, yeah, in the yeah. in sort of 
musician right. community. Um, it, it brings me to sort of to step start stepping towards the actual music. They I saw a video online that showed the very first time you kind of put your fingers on a harpeggi, um, oh, yeah. and the the and which I believe you take on on tour with you sometimes. Is that accurate? Uh, I did back in the day, but I don't anymore, Not anymore. now. The, the question I have is, um, when you first approach that instrument and there's a video that shows you playing it, um, there's just a transferable skill you possess to be able to approach a new instrument and play it and make music. Uh, and I was kind of floored. Like, you know, if I picked up a clarinet right now, I would just, I'd be lost. So well, I, if it makes you feel any better, if I picked up a clarinet right now, I'd be lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're equal on clarinets, um, but I don't know. There's there seems to be something about um, your ability with with instruments and the use of your hands that just I don't think everybody possesses. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that perspective, and I think I understand what you're saying. Let me just say that I played the clarinet for two weeks. It was one of the most god awful experience. <laughs> Nothing against clarinet players, but sure. for me, it was a horrible, horrible experience. I could not deal with that feeling in my mouth. Oh yeah, that. So, yeah. I just I was like, uh, no. I had like two or three weeks, and I said to the teacher, I, said, um, "I can't, I can't do this." So yeah, I mean, instruments that are that I can touch with my hands, you know, that I can press and like trigger a note. Yeah, I'm pretty good with that kind of stuff. Uh, and one of the reasons I can kind of like you know, do something that might be in the, in the realm of uh, impressive is because of my tabletop exercises. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm just kind of kidding, but because I have a lot of finger control and I have a good ear, you know, so yeah. I can put my hand down on something and I can, oh, da, 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 da. so if it's a harpeggi, you know, I can, I can find things and my fingers work yeah. and they're independent and I can do a harpeggi or I can play a continuum or I can pick up an eigenharp and, you know, move my fingers on the buttons and find something really cool and, you know, play and I, and play fingers in rhythm and you know so there is certain musical like t and uh, physical skills that translate well to certain things you know i also can play some guitar although i haven't played in a long time um i do i i but, know that you you uh, you and i skyped once uh and you just randomly picked up a guitar because it was at hand and you just started to shred on it and it i i, I stopped the conversation because i didn't know you were could play guitar that well it kind of freaked me out well <laughs> You know, uh, the way I got into playing at all is because um, my brother started taking guitar lessons when he, before I started making music. And I, he didn't learn much, but I sat on the steps of my house watching him take these lessons. And, uh, and I learned something. So I started to play. I was Apparently. playing the guitar before <laughs> I was playing the keyboard. Uh, but I never took guitar lessons. Yeah. Um, and I also never practiced it consistently, you know, day here, day here, maybe for a month and then like stop for a year and then, you know, that kind of thing. It, even when I played the infamous, uh, what was it? The LTE show in Chicago where the keyboard stopped work when the keyboard breaks, I think it was called. Yeah. Um, and I played, I look back and I was, I think, okay, I played pretty well, but I, it was, a, it was not a great situation because I hadn't played the guitar in a long time even before that, but now it's been even longer. I really, I mean, I've got all these beautiful guitars thanks to you know who, um, and I really should be playing more, but the same kind of skill, you know, it's the same type of thing. I'm tapping on things, you know, and that's uh, the guitar. The guitar part was a little, a little challenging in that most guitarists learn by pattern on the fretboard or they learn by like kind of like interval, yeah. but I have perfect pitch. And I don't think like that. I think, okay, you put your hand down here and that's an E. You put your hand down here and that's like an A. So I had to learn every dot, like what note it was before I could really, under I can't like think the other ways that, that well. Yeah. So the guitar was an interesting, has always been an interesting kind of thing for me. Still, I, I, as it's, um, your facility there is not trivial. I know it's not where you practice all the time. Um, right. But if someone saw you pick up a guitar and do what I saw, uh, there'd be some guitar envy going on. Um, let's talk about LTE3 a little bit, uh, which is pretty recent. Um, I've listened to the record a ton. I think it's great. The question I have is there's about a 22-year break between the second and third record. Was there um, anything that you felt like that, that amount of time 
the, how it informed the third record, whether how you guys wrote the production itself, um, you know, the difference in sonically in the songs, anything like as you look at it now, was it, what was the change or maturation? Yeah. Well, it, it was a really amazing experience to do LTE3 because it taught me so many things. It gave me so many different perspectives. First of all, I should say that going into it, it was a bit intense, the idea of going into another record with the guys after so many years, uh, in a big way because of all the anticipation. Sure. You know, all, all, for so many years, people saying, I want LTE3, I want LTE3, when are you going to do it? So many years, so many messages later, and I kind of felt like, wow, this is, this is making me a little nervous. Like, what are we going to come <laughs> up with? Um, so nervous, well, nervous is not the right word. Just a little bit more like, like kind of feeling like, wow, you know, What's going to happen? Like, I, I did feel like, you know, we're only going to be like, together in the studio for maybe two, three weeks. So what happens if the muse is not, you know, on my shoulder and with me? Yeah. Right. So I did prepare some riffs ahead of time. We were in vac on vacation, family vacation up in Rhode Island. I brought a little two octave keyboard with me and I set it up and I was banging on that a little bit, like just getting some ideas and making videos of the ideas and just saving them just in case. Um, so I had that. But of course, when I got together with the guys, there was no shortage of inspiration. And sure. I didn't think about any of the weird stuff. We just were making music and it flowed. And it was, just a, it was a great feeling to get in the room with, with all the guys. I mean, you know, for one, John and Mike and I hadn't been in the studio together in what, like 11 or, or 12 years or yeah, something like that. And, and we wasted no time. We were just, first of all, we were comfortable right from the get go. You know, we were just comfortable with the idea of getting together at that point. And we were just, you know, totally looking forward to it. We got in the studio, we started to work and it was like old times. We just, yeah. and we were just, and even better because we were just so happy to be there together and just working together. It made us just really kind of joyous. And of course with Tony, who's a wonderful guy and a great musician and the, the whole thing, I just got a real perspective of it. Like, you know, because, you know, you and I, we have so many friends that are musicians, so many talented musicians. And, you know, it's a tough business. And, and a lot of these guys are making some really great music. And you wonder why, why is it this music is, you know, so popular? Why is it, didn't this guy catch on? Or it's a little hard to understand. Yeah. Um, and I'm grateful for anything that comes my way. And for, the, and for the fact that I've been able to make a living as a musician. I mean, thank God, because I can't do anything else. But, um, but I kind of got a good... I got this feeling, I got this perspective, which I didn't have the first time, looking around, making music with everybody, and then hearing back, I was thinking, you know what? I thought to myself, there really is some kind of magic going on here. There's a real chemistry. These yeah, four is. guys, there's something, I get it. There's something special. And, I, and it was interesting to see that from a different perspective, because again, it's hard to understand why some music is it's people and other music doesn't. Yeah. Um, but I kind of got a perspective of that and I really appreciated that. And then we put out the album, of course, uh, you know, I, I'm in my own world up for a certain amount of time thinking, Oh, people probably dig this. And then we put it out and it's like, wow, like the response is so amazing. Like, Holy shit. This is beautiful. Like it, it's fantastic. So it's a, there's, not, there's something there and I appreciate it. And, uh, and I kind of got a, got, you know, a, a hit of it, which it's hard to do when you're in the middle of it, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's, um, I love that you had that moment of perspective on it because, you know, you can kind of, if you can pause long enough to just, um, be grateful that you're, you have the skills and that you have, that you're surrounded by, by players like this, but more than that, that you guys, um, have a chemistry because the, the record does not disappoint. Um, it's an amazing record. I I've been listening back to it in preparation for this conversation, uh, and the track that kind of been, um, running around in, in my head a lot is uh, blink of an eye. There's, there's, um, for me, that song runs through so many different sort of musical stylings. There's jazzy moments. There's uh, sort of, it gets sort of big and, and I guess traditionally sort of epically progressive later on. Um, yeah. but it, it, the point is, is that, uh, there, there's, there's a wide array of, of, flavors on this on this album and i think that's a hallmark of what you guys do but i i you know it gets my stamp of approval for what for whatever that's oh, worth <laughs> awesome. yeah and that one i think is completely improvised like oh, is it? I. yes well, I that's not the one that's not one of the ones on the main disc that's the one on the jam on the jam part of it well and i was gonna it, it's funny because i had the question 
uh, I was going to ask you is um, the structure of that is so unique. It made me wonder if that was planned or if it was organic. Oh, no, no, it totally happened. We just That's played. That's awesome. We just improvised. Yeah, it's right, a, right. So cool. S- such a cool track. Anybody That's who's awesome. not heard this record, uh, by the way, I, I always think it's great to listen to a record front to back, but pay attention to that track in particular, Blink of an Eye. It's um, It's just... It goes so many different musical places. It's kind of fun. Um, and best of all, it has the Aurelian stamp of approval. It has my stamp. I should get a real stamp, it shouldn't I? You, know? <laughs> you look hard stamp it like this one. Go <laughs> on. Um, before we move on to your solo uh, work, I have. I I, I kind of want to lump in. I hate to do this, but I I uh, I don't want to take your all your day. But you've done projects with. Um, Rod Morgenstein and also um, Tony Levin and uh, Marco uh, Miniman, two yeah. different uh, sort of album series. Do, would we think that there's chance of more of those in your future? Uh, you mean more like uh, uh, of, of of either RMP or uh, oh, yeah, of either of either combination, um, or is that you have enough going on that that's not really on the. You know, it's all possible. So I'd love to work with Rod again one day. And Rod, of course, you know, has played on my solo. He's worked on Wired for Madness. Sure. He's worked on like all my rock uh, solo albums. The last one, Marco Miniman played on, Rod played on. Um, and I am actually, uh, so anything is possible, but I am also thinking about my next kind of like rock, progressive, whatever you want to call it solo album kind of making okay. a plan now to start getting that done oh, um cool. and honestly at this moment i'm not sure how i'm going to proceed with it okay i'm not ready to announce anything particularly okay. but i know that i am going to start putting my energies on doing something in that vein like a follow-up okay. to like a wired for madness feeding the wheel rhythm of time you know maybe like rudis morgenstein kind of thing well let's um Let's use that yeah. as a segue. I do want to give a shout out to um, some records you did with Steve Wilson. I, I, I'll be honest, Jordan, I, I hadn't really listened to those. So I went and spent some time with them. And they might, in my estimation, and I know that music's always personal, they might be some of your most experimental music. Um, I really like them. The So anybody, uh, we've got so much to cover with Jordan, but I, I commend you to the work that he's done with Steve Wilson. You can see this all up on his website, and I think it's probably available on Spotify. But the albums are Grace for Drownings and Insurgents, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right. Really, right. like really, really interesting progressive rock music. Uh, maybe, oh, I mean, sometimes it's not even rock. It's like a really, it, it evokes like these really interesting, like ethereal moments for me. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, I enjoyed mm-hmm. them quite a bit. Awesome. Um, awesome. Let's talk about your solo uh, music. I counted 18 solo records going back quite a ways. By the way, there's a there's an absolutely wonderful Making of Listen by Jordan Rudess video on YouTube that has all these amazing pictures of you as a youngster. It's oh, so wow. much. You're, have you're you finding seen? some good stuff. Oh wow. my gosh. It's, uh, it, you get to see Jordan with the flowing locks and just, you know, at, at that age when hair was everything. Uh, it, and music's awesome. But it's a fun uh, retrospective, I think, if, if you haven't seen it. I mean, people can find that video on YouTube. i got to watch that myself. Yeah. Making a listen. Wow. It's, you send me the link. I don't even know where that is. I will. Like, I will when we get off. Um, so we can't cover all of your records, but I, I, I went back and listened to most of them. And um, one of the ones that really uh, kind of hit me was Rhythm of Time. Um, yeah. Different then. But I think for for say dream theater fans who have not forayed into your music it's a, it would be a good one to begin with like all of them are great and expressions of you but that one um it's got some flavors of dream theater so the progressive stuff right 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 sure i mean rhythm of time feeding the wheel similar in nature yeah certainly. not not redundant with um, but there's enough, uh, uh, if you draw the Venn diagram, there's enough of an overlap that Dream Theater fans, would, I think it would be a good bridge into Jordan Solo Land. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, that, and just a couple of shout outs, like the, the, the lineup on that record's got Greg Howe, Joe Satriani, Steve Morse, Vinnie Moore, uh, Dave LaRue, Rod, Rod Morgenstein. It's like a who's who record. Um, right, right. Um, it, was an import- it was an important record for me too. I mean, okay. it was just kind of, you know, I had certainly made a lot of music before that, but it was this great opportunity. It was kind of in the heyday of like Magna Carta and like they, 
you know, were really supportive of my doing this and helpful in getting all the guests. And, you know, and that was really having that kind of support was really a wonderful thing. And it was just a lot of inspiration that was floating a- around uh, in the air. For sure. And some of those songs I still play to this day, like Screaming Head or Ra. You know, people ask me about Insects Among Us and all this kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, that is is a good one to check out. Sure. It's a I mean, there are reasons for all of the records, really. And I don't I don't say that offhandedly, but um, that record's a really good one. I mean, there's also Notes on a Dream, which is a bunch of dream theater songs kind of rendered differently so if you like dream theater music like you know you're going to pick up the the phrase all of the melodic phrases and the songs um just kind of you know styled differently um as only jordan could do so i definitely commend that one but the record i I wanted to talk about too is all that is now um this is an absolutely gorgeous record jordan I, i grew up before i started getting into guitar centered music I listened to a lot of um, Wyndham Hills artists who did this Mm. just beautiful music that was just lent itself to reflection and uh, peace, Mm. you know, when you needed that. And I listened to this record and um, I, I, people need to to spend some time with this record. It's obviously very different than, than dream theater, but um, it's a place where I think we see a different side of Jordan. Um, You know, all of the facility with, his playing is there, but it's um, it's not restraint. But the the the, the melodies breathe more, um, and there's just all of this time to absorb the you know each change and the chord progressions. It's um, I spent more time with this, by the way, than anything else in preparation for wow. this that's, this interview. Oh, that's so nice that you enjoyed that. Well, I will say, if you like this part of me that lets things breathe, you probably like a chapter in time more than any of them. That and have you heard that one yet? I have. Have you? Heard- I have, okay, and that's I... My, that's my latest solo album. It's also very gentle, very mellow. And that's my of. note, is is um, it's very much in that space. And so, and that's your most recent record, just like within right. the last right. eight, ten weeks? Uh, yeah, exactly. But, but you know, talking about all that is now, what it's, I'm, I'm happy that you kind of pointed that out, because that album, it was the first time when I felt like I really wanted to, capture that personal kind of musical space that kind of when I sit down and it's more like almost like a a, a personal meditation and I go in the zone and the piano just kind of wraps around me and just becomes this thing of beauty and I can just go with it and flow and the music comes out and usually that that would happen when I'm by myself not because I don't want to share it, but it's just, you know, kind of a personal space. And sure. a lot of my career has been in the rock space. And, you know, so, but for this, I wanted to just get that, you know. So that's what I kind of went for. That's what I really worked on. Uh, and I feel, and the best thing about it is I feel like I captured it. You did. Like a lot of people don't know about that album. But for me, it's an important album personally because it's so personal and I successfully kind of captured what I feel and what I want to like transmit musically to other people, that kind of really peaceful, really flowing, really musical vibe. Um, you know, the difference between that album and like a chapter in time, well, there's many differences. Chapter in time is also very, very mellow, very gentle, a little bit more spacey. It uses a lot of like processed kind of like piano sounds that are, you almost hear some of the mechanics going on of the piano and interesting ambient uh, textures and sonics going on. Uh, all that is now is a bit more like real piano kind of like yeah. sounding in general. So, but those two albums, I guess, are the most personal uh, piano based albums that I have. And it's funny because, you know, a lot of people out there who, who think Jordan Rudis, you know, oh, he's playing a million notes, and da, 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 you know, why doesn't he slow down or something like that? But the reality is they don't even know. They have no idea. Like a lot of these people have no idea who I really am. And they don't, and they, they, that's okay. They just don't know. They've never heard my other side. They don't even know it exists. So of course, when I read anything like that, I'm like, oh, you know, it'd be nice if these people would, you know, understand who they're talking about before and it's, they. It's so you know, easy. It's two yeah. clicks for them to, to discover that. It's not like it's some hidden part. Um, because yeah. all of all, you know, I, I just went through the chronology uh, and many, some of it, most of it, I knew pretty well, but some of it I knew less well. 
And this oh. this was a delight. Uh, and I don't say this. I'm not just trying to shower you with praise. It's um, it's so calming. And it's uh, you just kind of flow along with it, and it takes you into a very peaceful place. Every every track, um, and I know I, I take your point that you know people know you for being for exceptional skills and wizardry moving up and down the keyboard, but is that as far from the extent of of your musical expression? And so that's why I wanted to spend time on this particular record. Oh, it's awesome! Yeah, I mean, it's you know, the, and they know, and it, it's understandable that they know they know me in that way because sure. I've toured around the world for how many years playing wild keyboards with like Dream Theater and whatever else, you know. And so I haven't given as much you know attention to the other side. I mean, I do at home in my own personal life, sure. but I haven't spent that much time career wise like putting that out there well that record uh it's there for people to enjoy and i take your point too that that um a chapter in time has some other pieces to it but there it, it family is better together with um all that is now than some of the other records in it's just sort of um beautiful restraint uh in terms of space for for the melodies um yeah my only yeah. my only regret there is that you're not coming to our town with for your tour so I'll, that's why well, I asked about the streaming. I'll have to jump on one well, of the streams. Hopefully. It can happen. It'll happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd be I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Wired for Madness because our paths crossed a little on this, um, and not just as a as a plug. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, not just as a plug for the the novella I wrote for it, but um, when you, when I first heard you sent me, I think a, a Dropbox share, this sort of um, thirty minute epic. Um, there's some like beautiful moments that are like very Pink Floydish. I don't know if this was in your head when you were writing them, but they just have this very um, like comfortably numb, like in in a good way. It's not like a it's not a, 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 a I don't an homage or anything. It's, it's still Jordan Rudess, but it, and you sing on this. Um, so I wanted to ask you that where did the where did the idea for this story to write this 30 minute epic come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's yes yeah, i don't know where these things come from <laughs> they arrive at my doorstep one day um you know one of the the whole wire from madness stuff and and uh, you know this was a i was trying to think of well first of all i can get these words out music comes easier for me than words obviously um but i realize that a lot of people when they're investing themselves in music it really helps them to have a concept to latch on to i'm sure that you know as much as you're into music you're very very sensitive to the story and the concept there and all those things and it really really sure. matters with me mostly honestly what matters is that the words don't interfere sonically with what's going on musically i like words that flow and are smooth and i only really notice the words when they're not sonically with the type of sound that's going on so but, you know, through the years, I've become a little bit smarter. And I thought, you know what, people, not everybody just totally is all about the music. They want to have something conceptual behind it as well. So, you know, I started to think about it a little bit. Like, what would be a cool concept? You know, what would be interesting to me? And what would be maybe interesting to everybody else? And I started to, I have this, uh, one of my very closest friends in the world, his name is Shem Cohen. And Shem and I are you know, we've been together forever, you know, and we get into spacey kind of ideas and we live kind of in a similar universe and, you know, and he's great. And he, you know, he'll like throw spacey concepts at me and it'll trigger me. And he's been responsible for a lot of the names of stuff that I've done. And oh, wow. so he and I really kind of came up with this original uh, you okay. know, story of which, of course, you took and refined and wrote this beautiful novella. People should read it. But the but the uh, but the initial story was something that we kind of devised, and it got me going. You know, it was, it was this whole idea of a person who, you know, that the the technology was at a point where somebody could go in and actually become extended. You know, where all of a sudden they could have their brain worked on and their physicality worked on, and they become kind of kind of like a super. Uh, superhuman in that sense. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think we're probably going there. But the other part of it was all the issues that that could really, you know, bring up. You start having these powers to, uh, you know, think of things in lightning speed. And, and it, it, a lot of it was about kind of the idea of getting rid, rid of almost like the doldrum of thinking. 
you know, yeah. and you'd have almost like a computer chip inside that would like take care of things and know things instantly. So, um, so that, you know, that became a really interesting story and it was, in, it was inspiring for me to do it. But one interesting thing that you'll appreciate, and maybe I shouldn't even divulge, is that the music started first. Like I started writing this whacked out piece. I would go, I went into my studio and I started like, I wrote like, let's say eight, 16 measures. And then next day I went in and said, okay, now I'll write another eight, 16 measures. And it was just kind of, I heard that and then I think, where could that go? Oh, maybe that'll go to here. Where could that go? And then I was thinking, this is madness. What is this? Like, where am I, what am I doing? I'm not writing a song here. I need something, some concept to put this together. Like, what's this all about? And so I developed the story to kind of support where I was going musically sure. that I thought would kind of make sense. So that in that sense, you know, the music drove the idea of the story and then it came together and it became part of it, which, uh, which is cool. And now I really appreciate it. I, th I think probably whenever I do, you know, I think I learned that lesson that there's more, especially for other people, like they want to, people want to have something cool beyond just the notes and the rhythms and the sound. They want to have something that they can it, also understand on another level. Yeah. There's a lot of time, a, a desire, natural desire for some sort of narrative. I, I think you can come at it either way. I, I wanted to tell you, um, I like, I actually ended up digging into your lyrics. Uh, and it sounds like that all came later, but there's a song called I'll be waiting. That's a part of that. And that was, I don't know if I ever told you this, that was the catalyst for the novella because it gave me the notion that the guy who makes the decision to sort of offload all the remedial functions, brain functions, in order to be able to focus on something else like higher ideological or higher idea thinking um, had lost a loved one. And that in this beyond, in this state that could exist beyond the mundane, this is where she was. And it was going to be the thing that helps him work through his grief. So that was the song that like flipped the switch oh, cool. for me. Uh, and uh, by the way, I re-listened to it and uh, I got chills listening to that song. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's, wow. it, it's beyond everything else. It's just a beautiful part of the 30 minute arc. Um, yeah. But yeah. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. I, you know, I also enjoyed writing lyrics uh, yeah? on that album. And I, it's funny because, you know, as I just described, I'm not like a, you know, when I, when I think of music, you know, the music really comes first and, and, and the words are, you know, secondary for me, but I do enjoy writing words. Like when I, I like the, the flow of them. I like the rhythm of them. I like the sound of them. Yeah. And therefore I like to make it happen. You did uh, a but great. Maybe I'm more concerned with the way they sound than what they mean. But you did you know, a great the, job on that record. It makes me, it, it, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, do you think you'll ever uh, throw your hat in the ring to write dr uh, dream theater lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> what's the next question <laughs> <laughs> fair enough there's so many people to write lyrics uh you know right, right um so let me um let me backtrack and then we'll go into dream theater and then i'll let you go i've got some obviously we want to cover dream theater but i have one more question that i wanted to address on your solo work the first yeah. time you sent me something to listen to you know, we were we'd been friends was your explorations um stuff oh. And it's the first effort that I know of um, where it was, I mean, you'd always had orchestral elements in dream yeah. theater and things, but it was the first time there was a bespoke uh, c compositional effort from you f for orchestra. Mm. Um, and it's, it's gorgeous, you know, and there's a whole story about um, how you worked with Aaron Baspu for, for to put yeah. that on. And um, there's so much we could talk about there, but maybe just for time. The, the question is what, how did you arrive at the decision? Hey, I'm going to go to another level and and really write an uh, uh, an, an orchestrated for orchestra because it's it's very ambitious. Yeah, it was a really big project on many many levels. I couldn't have done it without my wife, who's a producer. Mm. Uh, and the reason I say that is because to organize a whole orchestra and to raise the money to make it happen and all the different logistics to do that and put it out were major. There was major. Yeah. I did in those days. It was I don't know if it still exists, but there was a an organization called Pledge Music, and Pledge oh. Music was kind of like a Kickstarter for musicians. Yeah, I remember. Uh, that. Yeah, honestly, I don't know if it's still still around, but it was a, a way to raise money for projects and that kind of thing. And uh, and we did. We raised you know whatever number of dollars, sixty, seventy thousand dollars to like 
hire this Polish orchestra and to do everything that it took to make this album and fly me to Poland and, yeah. and the whole thing. Um, but it's something that I always wanted to do. I mean, fusing that kind of classical and rock space is, you know, it's a natural thing for me to want to go into. And I want, and it's, it, it was kind of another dream of mine to kind of put together my love of like, you know, Rachmaninoff and Prokofiev and Gershwin and, you know, and Chopin and Gentle Giant and Yes and, you know, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and all that stuff and yeah. bring it into one you know, massive kind of like uh, conglomeration of sorts. Um, and so it's amazing to think about because right at this moment, I don't think I have that much energy, but <laughs> there, to do that. I like, I, um, is there any chance that we would ever see that restaged? Or is that just too? Yeah, yeah. No, there's a chance we have the scores for that and everything. And, the, and it's possible, you know, the problem with that piece uh, was not musical. The problem with that piece was that it was very difficult. Uh. So, you know, the reality is with these orchestras around the world, they're used to going in for a rehearsal or two. They open up the page. They've played the Beethoven Symphony before. Sure. they played, you know, the whatever it is a million times. And, you know, when they open up explorations, they kind of go, what? Like, you know, and it's deep. You know, they really need a lot of rehearsal to play it really well. So uh, if I ever do it again, I think the advice that I, that I would hear from others and even give to myself is don't make the orchestra parts so hard yeah. because they really are hard. You know, it's just not, not that Stravinsky, you know, isn't, isn't hard. Sure. Shostakovich but it's isn't not, hard to play. Yeah, but it's not, you know, there's a lot of bands that will tour and they'll use just local musicians to, to backfill string parts, which is fine but they only have to really come in for one run through and then they can play live. Um, yeah. And the music's generally not as hard as exploration. That, yeah. And that's exactly right. Um, well, I hope, so, uh, man, I hope that yeah. that happens at some point. I would love to see that live. Yeah, no, it could happen. Sure. I just need an orchestra who will want to spend the time and, you know, take, take the time to really practice. I mean, when Aaron, uh, who you met, Aaron Boshbu, who you mentioned before, who's an, an enormous talent that I know you've worked with. I discovered Aaron when he was in Turkey as a college student and he was rounding up orchestras and writing arrangements of dream theater music and right. putting on concerts, you know, this is an incredible producer and musician doing amazing things. And uh, it was around the time that I got commissioned to do this piece and I needed somebody to help me with the traditional orchestration because I'm not a traditional orchestrator. I could mock it up in my studio with my tools, but actually remembering how high the trumpet goes and these kind of, you know, and I, sure. it's not my wheelhouse. So, um, so Aaron, actually, I met him. And when I met him and told him what a great job I thought he was doing, arranging my dream, you know, my music for his orchestra, I said, and also I got a little project for you. How would you like to help me with the orchestration of a piece that I'm writing? So he was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. So we started our, you know, long-term relationship. And the next thing you know, I'm flying him to Venezuela uh -huh. to work with one of the amazing youth orchestras there. And the way I met Aaron was he flew there like a week ahead of time to work with the orchestra. And then I flew down a few days before the show to work with them, you know, and play my part. And, uh, you know, I got a hit right then and there. Like, okay, well, he's been working his tail off and these young musicians, they've been working hard trying to learn this stuff. It was, you know, it's always yeah. up to the last minute of shedding, you know. Same thing happens to Dream Theater, quite honestly, with what, when, we're, when we do stuff with orchestra. I remember the Radio City gig, like, you know, as if it was yesterday. And, like, you know, John Petrucci and I, I remember at the rehearsal that was, like, the day before, like, the show, because they don't give you many rehearsals. They're trying to play, like, uh, the test that stumped them all. And it sounded like... Like, he and I, literally, we were standing in the room... I think both of us at the same time almost like backed up into the wall and like shrunk down and like looked at each other and going, Oh shit. Like <laughs> they can't play it. Like they just can't play it. And we were like, what are we going to do? Cause the concert's tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and then I have these memories of all the musicians cause we had another rehearsal the next day, but of course they have lights out at these union halls. Right. When the lights went out after the second rehearsal, they were all in the corners of the, of the radio city music hall in the back practicing like crazy yeah. freaking out because they didn't know they just think they, that, probably, well, they were hired to do a job you know and they, yeah that's and they probably it was a lot like this other scenario we described oh it's a rock guy he's probably got us doing a few you know stabs and swells you know in and out for our 
Well, well, right. Yeah, I don't even yeah. know if they had the opportunity to see the music that much ahead of time. But yeah. usually an orchestra will have the opportunity to, but they just don't. They don't open it up until, yeah. you know, the two rehearsals or the one rehearsal beforehand. Well, uh, let's use that as a transition to um, to Dream Theater Land. But, but like, uh, it's probably something I'll ask you every now and again because, um, boy, that would be something to see live is uh, the orchestration stuff. Uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe Aaron will. I think he's stuck in Turkey with the with COVID. Maybe he'll get a. Oh yeah, right, right. Okay, so Dream Theater. Oh. Um, so I've told you this before, but one of the things I love that you introduced to the sort of sonic signature of Dream Theater, I think, is a is a sense of humor, a sense of whimsy. Because in the context of some of these just amazing songs, all of a sudden we'll hear a ragtime section or something. Right, um, right. And it's not, it's not, again, it's, it, it's not the only thing you do, but it's something that I don't remember. And frankly, don't hear in other bands where there's just this sort of lightheartedness. And it's not like it's easy to do the, the part I've seen you play it um, even on YouTube. So here's how I do it. And you just do it slow and then you speed it up. Um, right. But it gives it, it gives the music um, some diversity. Uh, I wanted to be sure and say that because I think it's, it's, it's part of, it's one of the things that you brought to dream theater uh, maybe that it wasn't as much of an expression before, but your first record that I think you wrote with it and uh, with dream theater and correct me if I'm wrong is scenes from a memory. Was that the first? Yeah, you're right. Which, which is like when they do the polls, you know, dream theater fan polls, that is usually, if not, that's usually the most favorite album um, or yeah. in the top tier. Yeah. So For sure. What is, what was that? I mean, this was your first record with, writing with the band what was the process like and has that changed over time or have you guys kind of yeah it would definitely change well first of all let's talk about the uh, little you know the parts that make you smile yeah please so we were writing yeah so we were writing these riffs you know just very serious you know all the very technical kind of virtuosic riffs and all the stuff we do um and then you know i like to take motifs and just do different things with them and you know, first of all, from a more serious point of view, I'll like to take something that maybe is in the right hand or in the top voice and put it in the left hand and then put mm -hmm. chords over it and see what happens. We do that a lot in Dream Theater, Liquid Tension. Uh, it's just a compositional technique. You know, do 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 and I'll put chords over it, and then I'll do 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 and then different bass notes, and, you know, a lot can happen with, it, with an idea and can shuffle it around. So uh, I remember, just like it was the other day, so we were doing but it was in straight time all these notes and of course i was thinking oh i could make this into a ragtime so i started to play it for the guys and they basically laughed they laughed and i think they were all ready to move on cuz you know i was just i was in this space where i could make them smile you know while we were working and and, you know, a lot of the Jordan things, I don't know about a lot, but some Jordan things that I do makes the guys smile and then they move on because it's not stylistically, you know, part of what, what Dream Theater would, would ever do. Sure. Um, but in this particular case, I did that. And then right before they were ready to move on, they kind of stopped and went, wait a minute, maybe we should do that. Like that, you know, it's silly, but could be cool. So uh, anyway, we obviously we decided to do that and we yeah. left it in. And I really learned something, which I think is really important. And I bring it up every now and then when we're writing, which is that our music is so serious. You know, it can, it can get really like heady and very intense and, you know, all these kind of things. And I think it's really good to break it up a little bit. You know, you make somebody smile. Just have a good time. Do something ridiculous, funny, like a different style. I like throwing in, like we've done, uh, you know, you can hear in LTE records and Dream Theater records where we all of a sudden break into like a Latin groove or something like that. Yeah. It's like, what? You know, and those are great moments because they make you smile. Or we break into something that sounds extremely Middle Eastern or, you know. and Yeah. These are, it's important. It's important to have a, when you have something that's that serious, it's important to have a little levity in the situation. Yeah. It's so, like a palate cleanser. Uh, right. You know? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It is. And, and so that's, that's that part of it. Yeah. So, um, and I, I mean, I guess it's understandable and would make sense that your processes for writing um, would evolve, but with like you, you coming into the group and I know that you were, they had pursued you twice. The first time you told them no for personal reasons and stayed with the dregs. Um, right. This time you said yes. But I, um, I guess I'm just like 
interested, like you came into a time when they decided to write the sequel to Metropolis, like, right. like arguably the, the most important song to many Dream Theater fans, and you're going to follow it up. And I know full well from my other life in, in the writing world, whenever you do a sequel, like there's a risk. Because if you mm. don't exceed even the first, they're going to take you to task. And you guys crushed it. So I just wanted to have you talk a little bit about the, that, that, that experience. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, the guys, first of all, um, you know, the guys were very into this idea of doing this follow-up because the first one was very popular. And, you know, and this was a more stretched out. All of a sudden, we're making a whole album, you know, like with a whole story and a whole thing. And it became a bigger, you know, yeah. it just be, it kind of came to life in this really bigger way. Um, but, you know, I was not in charge of the story at all. I was in charge of helping write the music. I was a newcomer, first of all, coming into this. And they had a bunch of riffs, you know, that they had from various sessions and stuff that we were, you know, sh they were sh bringing into the room and showing me that we were tossing around. And I was, uh, you know, adding my two cents to, uh, to everything. In those days, I thought that it was a good idea to come in, like, with some ideas into the studio and I didn't realize that they were kind of like, they didn't really like to work that way. It was kind of more like, you know, we, we write together, you know, everything comes together. I remember showing up at the studio, I had like 50 ideas, 50 <laughs> things. Wow. I just thought, <clears throat> let me show them this, let me show them that. I thought that was, you know, what I kind of had to do. Sure. And I remember Mike saying to me, wow, it's, that's not really the way we work. You know, usually we, we write when we're together, you know. But he still listened to every one of the ideas because okay. that's the way he is. <laughs> and some of the stuff we used, oh, good. you know. Um, you know, one of the biggest differences in, in the way that I work with the band now and the way I work with them then is I went crazy, like, to orchestrating. I kind of did my own, like, thing in a way, just layering all these parts and all these things ended up that we took things out like they went through and it was more like oh yeah that's awesome but we don't really need that part and maybe that's cool but we don't really need that or that because i didn't know you know like first of all john petrucci's guitar is as big as my house you know it's like <laughs> it's a wall of sound that you know you need to be conscious of how you're putting things you know in the mix so you know every album i learned more and more we all learn more and more about how to let everything survive in a mix. Yeah. In those days, I would just be like, okay, I think I'll play this part. I think I'll do this part. Now I'll play another part. You know, so I had a lot of extra parts. I think somewhere online you could hear like some of that stuff, okay. actually. I don't know the link, but there might be places where you can go and actually hear some of the other parts that I had. Oh, uh, that would be fun. Yeah, the, the, the cutting album. room floor stuff. Yeah. So, um, so there was that, there was that learning process and it made me a little sad. I was like, Oh, I like, I like that part. I like all that, but you know, it wasn't a keyboard album. It was kind of like yeah. fitting into a group. So, um, but there was a lot of inspiration in those days. I remember like, you know, finally free, you know, I'm writing these chords and then I upstairs and what is it called? Bear track studio or yeah, bear track studio. And then I come down and James was listening to it. He was in the lounge and he starts singing this melody and I go, yeah, that's perfect. And then we put it together. And next thing you know, that's happening. There's a lot of just, everybody was inspired. I was inspired because I was all of a sudden working with them yeah. in this new way. Cause I had worked with John and Mike and LTE, but not the other John. Um, and not James. So I was feeling a lot of, you know, energy about being there and they were inspired and, and they were also given um, a new kind of force to being able to do this because, you know, John Petrucci is incredible as he is. He, he kind of, you know, wanted slash needed a writing partner. Yeah. You know, and, and I think when I came into the band, that's one of the reasons that they brought me in. Yeah. Is because John felt like I would be a good writing partner for him. I think that know? I was going to mention that I feel like um, I've seen, and I, I'm not there, and I have no inside information. But if I were to instinctively kind of um, and have look at the band, it feels like the, the pair of you fa have found this just really amazing chemistry. I mean, in spades, it, it's on on display in the astonishing, and that was very public. Like, hey, we kind of went and woodshedded to to come up with this. Um, yeah. But there's a synergy there for sure. And I think well, there's a lot of yeah. players that are really, really fast, really, really good 
out there. It's a different thing to take all of that and have the chemistry and to write songs. Um, right, right. And I mean, anything that John and I have done, and I want to make sure because, you know, people get all kinds of crazy ideas about who did what and that, and that, you know, and I say all that about John and I, but I also want to say like, you know, when, uh, in the, when I was in Dream Theater with Mike Portnoy, incredibly integral part of the whole process. Sure. I mean, Mike wasn't there writing the notes and the chords, so to speak. John and I really mostly do that. That's, that's our domain is, sure. you know, we're at our keyboard, we're at our guitar and we're, that's what we're doing. Um, and Mike Portnoy, you know, he wrote a lot of melodies back then, but he also was, you know, a range, he was really a ranger guy, really very yeah. capable to, uh, you know, to, to do song all structure this kind of, and like, stuff. Yeah. Song structure and always had a lot to say about that. Sure. Well, um, I mean, let me um let me ask you a couple of specific things. There's so many great moments in uh, in Dream Theater that I could talk about, but there's a there's a couple that I will just focus on to exemplify like the rest. There's a there's a choice you made in um, a song called "Beneath the Surface" mm -hmm. um, for off of a dramatic turn of events um, for the solo, and right. um, I, it struck me when I first heard it. And uh, I went and have re listened to it, and it strikes me the same way. I don't know what the sound is you chose to play, um, what the you know the the VST or whatever it is, but it yeah. has this sort of um, the the sound itself to me. And this could be personal reaction. Feels like kind of um, memory and regret, which is exactly what the song is about. It's like the perfect lead choice. Um, and then beneath it, you've got some like pulsing strings and it just kind of brings, it, it really comes to this emotional crescendo. And it, the question that, that comes from that for me is when you make these choices on patches where you're really taking over the melody, like you're, mm -hmm. you're effectively the, the lead singer now uh, and mm -hmm. you're communicating, um, how much of that choice is something that like you just know, you have this bank of knowledge of these sounds kind of evoke these feelings and how much of it is just, uh, just instinct. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, a, a lot of times when I'm playing like a lead, I'll go to a signature kind of a lead sound, something that's maybe a little bit more aggressive or whatever, like my lead tone or tones. Yeah. Um, I think that sound is more like in the range of like almost like a lucky manish kind of a sound, like an Emerson inspired type yeah. of tone, if I remember correctly. Um, but, you know, like the guys... For one thing, the guys in the band, like they like, they're drawn to like classic kind of like tones, oh. like aside from my lead sound, like, um, you know, like if we're working, sometimes they'll, they'll say, like John will say to me or something like, you know, like that rush sound, wow, you know, like something that it was part of their childhood or whatever, you know, that they, whereas I'm like, you know, I've, in, to, in my mind, I've got like 3 million sounds, right? but they sometimes want to point to a specific kind of sound that is in their memory bank that might be for this particular i'm not saying that that solo was like that but i'm yeah. saying in general um but you know for, but from a musical point of view i'm looking for things that you know speak clearly that will sh that will uh have a timbre that can be above the band that are pleasant to, that respond well to my to my fingers on the keys and you know that kind of stuff. Like on the new on the new album, on the new Dream Theater album, you know, obviously can't get totally into talking about that because I'm not supposed to. But um, you know, I brought my mini moog there. Oh, I, brought, nice. I bought this vintage mini moog from 1971, I think it is, and I brought it there. And it's you know, and I would just I played a bunch of lines on that. that That's just awesome. Kind of four, four front lines, and it just sounds so nice. And you know, on that, I'm able to just turn the dials until it's exactly what I really want. Get just the right amount of glide, and you know, it was brave of me to bring my, uh, you know, my trophy piece, if you will, my vintage mini moog there. And actually, Maddie had to open it up one day just because something got unseated or whatever. It didn't make sound, and he fixed it. Our head tech, okay. uh, but now it's back. So that's <laughs> so, fun. I didn't, I didn't know that. That'll be fun to hear that on the new record yeah yeah there's a lot of good stuff on the new record a lot of the keyboard i'm very very proud of these keyboard tracks it's probably the i'm probably more proud of these keyboard tracks on this album than anything i've ever done oh wow uh, with Spring theater yeah That's, in, yeah in, in a big way and then part of the credit is due to uh jimmy t as well who's our illustrious uh engineer 
yeah. who did the, who recorded Liquid Tension Experiment, who did the last Dream Theater album, and who recorded this album. He and I worked very closely in the studio, really finding, crafting the sounds, and uh, you know, it, it was it was really a great experience. The the that seems to be the consensus um, that I hear, uh, whether whether it's me or just uh, hearing it or um, other places in the trades. Um, the, you, you know, while you can all, it's always you always are proud of the thing you did. There's the you guys specifically are excited about what you put in the can this time, um, which yeah. which necessarily means the rest of us Dream Theater fans are excited. Um, yeah, so. yeah, it's a nice buzz going on about it, and I think that it'll be really worth it, and everybody will be really happy when they hear it. Yeah, we're all looking forward to it. Um, yeah, man. One, only a couple more questions, Jordan. One is, um, you know, the the music. While there's definitely places that breathe and are dreamy, that we've talked about, there's there's places in the mu- in the dream theater music that's really aggressive. It's, it's technically challenging. Are there are there places in in or, or particular songs where you kind of have to focus that much more, or is it by the time you get on the road you're dialed in and it's really just you know performing at that point? Uh, yeah, I mean I try to get to the point where we're on the road and things are pretty dialed in, but of course, especially the first few shows, maybe they're not quite dialed yeah. yet. For some reason that always seems to happen, you know. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely songs, there's definitely parts of the music, and a lot of times it's just self-inflicted, where I'll be trying to play like more than just like one take's worth of keyboard parts at the same time, because uh-huh. I'm trying to do more things live. So I'm saying, okay, well, in my left hand, I'll play the chord thing. My right hand, I'll do this crazy lead thing. And then, you know, it's like more than, more than uh, most people would want to take on. Yeah. <clears throat> That's my own little issue. But um yeah, so that takes time. I remember doing, uh, what was it, The Gift of Music. It's this, the end part. It's a wacky, if you remember the way that song ends, it's pretty wacky. Like John and I are playing these crazy lines and this weird stuff going on. It's yeah. all a lot of counterpoint and just weird. And I remember when I arrived to do the music video for that, I had practiced it because I needed my hands to be in sync with the track. Right. That was, I wasn't even like, you know, the way these things are done. You're not even really playing it, but you want to, you want to be playing sure. it. So it feels right. So, um, but then it was, I felt like it was falling. It was kind of falling apart there. And I had to come home and I said, okay, well, good that I did this. Cause now I really need to practice this more so I can get it locked in. Yeah. So uh, there are parts of the music that when we play a night, generally speaking, you know, let's say, 85 90 percent of the stuff is just more like you know just, you're just playing along you know and you're it, just yeah. doing it then this parts where it's like okay i'm gonna focus it's gonna be very still i'm just gonna go you'll see when we're playing our crazy like unison lines especially ones that are extended and stuff like that yeah that i'll get very still and sometimes i'll even stand on one foot almost like a like a, almost like a yoga balancing thing or something yeah. like that i'm trying to remind myself that i don't need to expend more energy than is needed to do this really like challenging part yeah. that it's better accomplished if I become still. So I'll stop. I'll be, you know, rocking out, playing, do, do, do my thing, spinning the keyboard. And all of a sudden it's, yeah, and you'll see sense. me get really still. And that's why, because I, because I know that it's not going to come out as well. Uh, you know, if I'm trying to like show off and I'm moving around and putting on a, a physical entertainment show, I need to, those points need to focus in and just play the part and be really calm. No, no extra body motions and all the stuff and yeah. kind of go into that. It makes a hundred percent sense to me. The times I've been on stage when I want to be, uh, exert myself, then I'm out of breath when I need to sing the big notes and that's no good. So I, right. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Well, let's um. So let's kind of close it out and talk. Just ask you. Um, you've done so much, and I've tried to cover a lot of it here. But the the question would remain: Are there musical, ex you know expressions that you've not yet done that you want to do, like writing for musical theater or a country album? Like I'm I'm being facetious, but is there something yeah. you know? <clears throat> yeah. Um. Sure. I mean, one of the things that I'm very interested in, and I, I still like to, I would still like to dive into and do more of, is um, the 3D audio space. Uh, Working with like 
spatial audio and moving the sound all around the room and, you know, all the incredible things that you can do with ambisonics uh, and other kinds of spatial audio uh, techniques. Yeah. I think that that would, that would be amazing, like with VR and stuff like that. And, you know, into all these spacey kind of like concepts. Yeah, and also like in my apps, I want to build instrument apps that also sonically operate in that kind of 3D space. So I'm kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty busy as one can imagine, but I'm kind of putting my energy, my feelers out, starting to do stuff. Uh, actually talking to a company called Zillia about doing something right here in my streaming room uh, where I do all my like Patreon kind of live streams around my piano and doing a 3D audio experience and video as well. So you could basically walk around the room oh, wow. and hear not only my piano, but maybe cool sounds coming from the different corners of the room and experience all that. So we're, I'm sitting here looking at a couple boxes of like, you know, all these 360 microphones and everything like that. So that's cool. So, I'm, so I am investing some time into doing that. And I, and that's, so that's one of the, you know, one of the things that I'm looking forward to. That seems, I mean, that seems uh, reachable. I mean, there's, there's so much um, AR and VR going on right now. uh, And so much with Dolby Atmos, I think is their recent thing. Um, Right. Man, you're the guy to do that. You're the guy to bring some sort of experience like that to life. So, I mean, so, so many people who are listening to this now and who'll see it later, you know, they're, they'll be happy if all you do is dream theater. But I'm, I want to expose them to so much more because you've got so much more ambition and so many more uh, sonic lives that that um, uh, yeah, I want yeah. them to hear. We, we should we just should expose them to uh, a little bit of geo shred. Let's do. I have, I have it here. We can. I, I'm I'm thinking it'll come through pretty well. Let's try. Yeah. Tell me. If you, uh, tell me if you hear the sound. I'll put this down so you can see it. Actually, yeah, it'll have to come through. This yeah, that's tell perfect. Me if you hear this. How about now? Yeah. So you get sounds like that and geo shred. They're very, very expressive, which is really, really a lot of fun. You can do things like with saxophone type of sounds. Maybe you could have something like this. That is so cool, man. A little quick taste of Geo Shred, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the thing, I was watching your fingers there in a way that I actually haven't before, and watching the way that you like position your fingertips at edges of notes in order to give them like these inflections, yeah. uh, as awesome. the tremolo, of course, uh, how you move into notes, like it, the way they, uh, yeah. yeah well, it's Yeah, it's ahead. interesting because this instrument is all about that. I'll just show you briefly. So let's take a sound like... Um, Oh, let's look at the cello, because that's a really, really nice one. Um, so every note is basically a control area unto itself. So if I play this note, I can start at the bottom of the note, right? It's very quiet. The top of the note has a lot of attack, the bottom not, but as you move up. Yeah. You really have that full kind of... slide see one of the things about geo shred is that 
it's got this amazing pitch intelligence. You can kind of go into what I call the Steve Vai kind of Jeff Beck mode, which means that, you know, the way they do these amazing things with the whammy bar. So like um, here for that, for that, I'll actually go back to one of the more standard uh, sounds like something like this where so you can start at one note and slide to another note that maybe like an interval of a fifth or whatever away you start out in tune and you have this smooth glide and when you get to your destination it'll also be in tune when you stop your finger for a moment like yeah which is really, really cool because it's, it's, you know, it's something to be able to play a fretless instrument and have control where you get to your destination and the destination is perfectly in tune. So as soon as my finger reaches its destination, it's, it's in tune. And then as soon as I start to move, it tracks it again. Yeah, man. So that's like the magic. And also, since it's physically modeled, you give the note a little bit of love and it starts to sing. It starts to play more. Whereas if you leave your finger to still, it can just kind of like begin to die until you, come on. So when I when you're doing that when you're touching it in a place I'm seeing circles in other places on the on the display what are those Have you been taking some weird stuff what's going on <laughs> <laughs> We have been talking about LSD um I I I couldn't it's not an artifact right or is it giving you other like potential notes It's showing you where all the other notes of the of like I press an F and you oh, don't see. have to have this but it's a guide Right now, with a default, it's like all in fourths. You can have any scale highlighted on the surface, or you can have just the right notes to this whatever scale you want. You don't even have to have in between notes like on the scale. You just have like the C blues scale and only that. It's very, very flexible in that way. So, but when I play a G, all the Gs in the screen light up yeah. to give you a feeling of where they are so you can move around. But if you're like a bass player, a guitar player, Chances are you can wrap your head around this interface very fast because, again, it's, you know, E, A, D, G. It's just all in fourth, and it's frets going across. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> wow, so powerful. It's such a powerful it's tool. Very powerful. And the sounds are are you know at the very least equal to any desktop application i mean the yeah. sax and the cello and the flute and clarinet and all those sounds they're like they are like extremely professional uh you know expressive instruments that are that are partly made to be as as um expressive as they are by the nature of the playing surface yeah so, so but an instrument like this you can play this from a keyboard and you can also use this kind of this kind of approach and plug your iPad as a controller into any synthesizer and get this kind of pitch bending uh, magic. I kind of I was going to ask if it could affect because I you you this is something you use live. Um, oh, totally! Now, this it is really is part of your rhythm. matter of fact. I I also used it on the new Dream Theater album for two things. One is I played in a cello. There's a whole cello section. Oh, nice! That I played on Geo Shred, and there's an electric violin uh, thing that I did too by running the violin through some distortions. So that's, that's enough about that. That's, yeah, yeah, we don't want to give the secret. <laughs> we got to talk about that another day. I'm giving away the shop here. We got to... <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you do? Did you dose me with truth serum? What's going on here? <laughs> I got to get it out of you. Uh, no, I, I'm, so, I'm so happy you showed that uh, because the I think it... it um, until you see it, uh, it, could, it could seem uh, daunting. But to see how how um, easy it is to to use, um, I mean, that's I, I could even use it. I'm gonna have to go download it. 
You could totally use it because one of the reasons I made this instrument, one of the th reasons I do what I do is because I want guys who are not usually like music makers on that level. I mean, you obviously are a great singer, but, but you know, you're not used to playing an instrument like that. But yeah. I, and I wanted people to be able to put their hand down on it and move and be able to go through the right scale, all the right notes and get expression and be able to do all that magical stuff. And because it, it's a different feeling when you're making the music like that. So a lot of the patches we have on GeoShred are set up. So like there's a backing track, but then what's on the playing surface are all the right notes. So all you really got to do is slide your finger around. Yeah. You don't even have to do, you don't even have to practice your tabletop exercises to do like an effective GeoShred performance. I could show you how to play the blues in 30 seconds to where you'd be like impressing your friends. It's really oh, pretty wow. cool. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go get it uh, and spend some time with it. I'm I'm cool. I've known it was awesome, um, but I I I've never stopped to see a demonstration like that. You've I know you've done oh, this wow. before, um, so I'm glad that people get to see this because I think it's illuminating how how easy and how powerful it is. Um, yeah. So yeah. the other thing then, because um, I, I I've taken you way more of your time than I told you I would, but thank you for that. I, I want to be sure we we leave people with some things. Um, first of all, you are doing these shows um, right now. The shows seem to span between May and July. That's right. There are like six or seven shows. All the shows are on my website. Okay. Um, but they're all they're all. I'm just looking them up. They're all East Coast uh, shows. Right. And they're in New York. Well, let's see. They they start out in uh, Maryland, in Virginia, New Jersey, New Jersey. Pennsylvania and New York. Okay. So if anybody is near, uh, you'll look at the, you know, people can look at the website. Yeah, Annapolis, the, Alexandria, South Orange, uh, Red Bank, Sellersville, Pennsylvania, Saratoga Springs, New York. Those are where the, that's where the shows are. When will, and, um, so those yeah. of us who are on the West Coast, when will you know if any of those might offer a streaming option? Um, just keep checking back I think or if you go to my Instagram site or even Facebook, like it'll, it's, sh I'm pretty sure we listed. We okay. Um, I'm pretty sure that we, cause I've seen you on. find that and I'm going to tell everybody I've seen Jordan live. In Here it is. Yeah, no, I've, I'm looking at it right now. Like okay. May 15th, the show is in uh, South Orange is streaming. Oh, great. Um, and also the, tw uh, June 25th in Sellersville, Pennsylvania, the live stream is available. Saratoga Springs on July 2nd and 3rd, the live stream is also available. So I think those are the ones that will be streaming. So, so for us, all those of us who are in the Midwest or globally, frankly, who can't get there live, uh, join the stream. I will say if you can get there live, I've seen Jordan do his, his solo Thing. He, he came through Seattle here uh, not that many years ago, and it's a treat. It, it, it's a treat to get to see him um, just be the guy on the stage with the keyboard. Uh, that night it was right. it was really mostly piano. You did a whole thing where you brought out your, your iPad. Um, yeah, so, and it'll be mostly piano for these shows as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, some Bach, some Chopin, some LTE, some Chapter in Time music, you know. Yeah. The, the, it's the Jordan Rudis experience, if you will. <laughs> it, yeah, I'm. I'm going to be there. I'll. I, I'll make one of the streams. Um, and I also yeah. wanted to um, give you just a, a, a quick opportunity to say a little bit about um, some of the stuff you're doing. Um, not just through your website, but the information is there in your online conservatory, um, and all the stuff you're doing for your, your um, Wisdom Music Academy, because these are ways for yeah. people to learn. I think in what they call both push and pull, both there's materials for you to go get, and there's also your Patreon and ways for people to engage with you. So can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there? Sure. Um, yeah, so I set up about a year ago, I was looking for an outlet that allowed people to give back for all the things that I like to share. Like I really love streaming and I was doing a lot of it when the whole lockdown happened, but at a certain point I was like, you know what? I want to keep doing this, but I want to enable people the possibility of being able to give something back instead of having all music be free all the time. I wanted to stop that message and, you know, just kind of like put it in a better place. So I started a Patreon <clears throat> and it's been amazing on so many levels. The first level it's been amazing is because I'm somebody who not only likes people and likes to share, but I also like to get some energy back 
Uh, and I like having a mechanism that allows me to communicate with people that is not like, you know, this message is coming from Instagram, this one's coming from Facebook, and this one's coming from Twitter, and oh, I can't answer anybody. Now I give people the opportunity to join me on my Patreon, and they can select a tier. There's different tiers from kind of simple tiers that allow you to just check in with all my streams, which I do at least one a week. Uh, but uh, you also have streams which enable you to be part of the Wisdom Music Academy, which is like a ten dollar tier, and and that I'm I put up exercises, I put up riffs, I'll post you know sections of like LTE music or Dream Theater music where I'll put up the notation. Um, so it's a really it's a it's kind of a learning environment as well as you know entertaining yeah. uh, and other things. And there's also um, there's also tiers within it that allow me to have a conversation with you every whatever it is six months I think or three months I don't remember. Um, so I set up this world that not only keeps me able to do the sharing that I love to do and gives people the opportunity to give back, um, but it also financially is, is you know, something that helps to uh, keep myself and my family fed. Right. Uh, you know, I think that, I think, you know, a lot of people out there have, kind of have this funny notion that, you know, all of us in dream theater live like, you know, in some kind of castles up on a hill or something like that, you know, yeah. with, with armed guards and, and servants all around us. And unfortunately, it's not like the seven. Maybe if we, dream theater was alive in the 70s, it might be like that. But, yeah. you know, we're working. We work as hard as anybody to, uh, you know, make a living and do our thing. And, and honestly, as much as I love Patreon, besides any financial thing, because I really do, the fact that it also is another way to kind of use my talents and you know what i do to uh to make a living it's a good thing so that's that's yeah. a nice part of patreon that no, it helps it, with that i think it sets, sends the right message that um i think people know how authentic you are if they have had any exposure to you but it sends the right message that um you know music what you offer isn't is it it's how you feed your family uh, I'm like, I shared a thing with you, I think through email or maybe it was someone else, but there are these websites that do this, like, Hey, this, this person's net worth is X and they, they come up with these crazy millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> and I, not, I researched real, yeah. it. Yeah. And the, the, the people who put this, this information up, they're not even journalists, not that a journalist could, is qualified to do it, but they're just like any schmo who like decides they want to like do it. So it creates this misperception that, you know, Jordan Rudess lives like a king. We certainly don't need to pay for his music. Um, and the fact that you and all the guys work so hard, like um, yeah. making records and in engaging with fans and doing lessons and, and all the stuff, it tells yeah. you that, like, you know, it's how you feed your family. It's a Yeah, I mean, think about it, and, and I appreciate your pointing that out. I mean, we are hard, we love what we do. We enjoy what we do. Sure. So, you know, you can't fault us for loving what we do. But at the same time, the, this is our job, and we do it, and we're really on it because it's a combination of, yes, we love what we do, but we have to work. Yeah. The Dream Theater has to tour. At some point, we need to go back on tour, yeah. right? Unless we figure out some other mechanism. Otherwise, that's not going to be a, that's not going to be good. Um but so, there, so there's that whole, you know, part of it that's really important to realize that we are working musicians. But the other thing I was going to say was that in the music business, it's very different than a lot of other businesses. I have a lot of my friends who are my age are retiring. Yeah. They're, not that I would want to retire because, again, I love what I do. But the reality is I'm surrounded by my, you know, friends like uh, that are like oh i stopped working like five years ago i'm just you know i got my pension or i got you know, whatever i don't need to work yeah. and i'm like wow and in a way i'm feeling like wow that's not the career i chose i need to work i really need to work but i wouldn't stop anyway sure but but it know, is like but, it is a, it's part of the path like there's this i don't know what the graph looks like but there's some very 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 small set of musicians who make the gajillions of dollars and mm -hmm. then there's there's a huge huge stripe in the middle who are known who are great musicians with great music, but they don't have that luxury. Like they they have to as much as they do love it. And there's no that's no crime to love what you do. Right. They no. they, they have to right. they have to work in order to pay mortgage and work. all the things. Yeah. And I was I was uh, I, I was, there was a. Uh, um, something that came out like on what was it, like blabbermouth or something like that. It says. Like Jordan, it was like Jordan Rudis says that you shouldn't 
be a musician to like for your for your livelihood. I don't remember the exact quote. Yeah. It's like, it's something to do with my saying that you shouldn't depend on music to make a living or something like that. And I felt, you know, it was it was part of a discussion where I said many of the happiest musicians that I know are ones that are not depending on it to, you know, make money. Yeah. And that, there is a reality to that. There's a lot of guys who happen to have careers that have a bunch of time sure. otherwise, and they can make music, they can make whatever kind of music they like, and they don't have to worry about it. And they don't have to bring in any money with their music. And that's a lovely place to be in. Personally, you know, this is what I do. I've always done it. I don't really have any other skills. And thank God it worked out. Um, you know, but I want to just say that, you know, people should definitely follow their heart. You should find a way in life to spend time doing what you love to do. And that's what it is. And it was, we all have to eat. So there's a balance there. It was a very, I saw it. It was a very un unfair quote. It was clear that it had been manipulated for shock value. Um, well, that's what's happening in the, in the media these days more than ever. I mean, it's almost like, you know, when I talk to people, I get, now I'm worried. Like, what is it that I said that they're going to pull out? People will see the headline and, and just, like what? Yeah, yeah. He's uh, telling everybody not to be musicians. Um, I, I mean, that's that not was, the case at all. I'm yeah. not, I wasn't. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> I'm the, here to say that's not what I meant. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, going back to where we started, you you were on a path. You could have been a career concert pianist, and and but you followed your heart, and you followed your heart into a, a different kind of music that didn't have any certainties to it. Um. But, you know, you've had, I think your your work ethic and your creativity have borne fruit, and we've all been the benefactors of that fruit. But it doesn't mean that you are, are in a position to stop doing it. And uh, I want to say it out loud again, like it's, it's 100% valid um, that uh, any musician, not, ju not just j you, Jordan, um, do things like a Patreon where they, they give of their knowledge and their understanding and their compassion – and their talents in a value exchange. That's what the world is. And well said, yeah, right. That's what it is. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, totally. And and people should know. Like, and then you know, we have people listening that are thinking, oh, you know, like uh, <clears throat> there are no gigs or whatever. So I should start a Patreon, or I should go on Twitch, or you know, just to realize that, yeah, probably you know, a lot of people out there should do that, and it's another great way to interact and everything. But I do want to point out that these these services at least right now maybe they'll they're i think they're trying to change them a little bit but like patreon is not going to help you all of a sudden find like a lot of followers right they're not going to do the work to like bring in an audience like if you're a guy who plays a couple of clubs here and there you love music and you're thinking oh i can do patreon well if five people came to your club show then maybe you'll get one of them one day to be a patron. But it's, in other words, it's not, you can't depend on them to like market you and do it. The reason that I can have a Patreon that kind of works for me is because I have a certain number of fans and a small right. percentage of them are really dedicated and into it and they become patrons. Yeah. So, but they're, you know, that's another discussion too. What can musicians do to, uh, you know, extend their careers and become noticed nowadays? There are things that, you know, certainly we can discuss. It's changed. That's for another day. It's for another day. It's, it's changed yeah. for sure. Um, but you know, the, 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 I've, I, I've, I've seen what you do. Um, and you're, you know, you're very gracious with your, with your time. Uh, and this is an example. You've given me a bunch of time for us to talk about these things. Um, so, you know, uh, while I am not a, a keyboard player, uh, I have no reservation in, in recommending that like, this is Jordan is a place where, um, you could, learn and grow and there's so much material his website's very extensive so i uh spend some time there um there's there's a lot of information a lot of great like i went down some rabbit holes that i shared earlier in in the stream uh and found some wonderful wonderful old clips of jordan so much music that you probably haven't heard that jordan has created uh, i i envy that you don't that uh, that you get that treat because um i just experienced that over the past couple of weeks um, so Jordan, I think I should give you your day back. Um, I want to tell you, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Well, thank you so much, my friend. It's great to see you and thank you for all the wonderful topics and yeah. just allowing us to kind of go down those interesting paths that, you know, we don't often, some of them we don't often go down, you know, it's interesting to talk about a lot of those things. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you take care. And um, we'll look forward to um, all of your musical, musical expressions that are coming. Uh, of course, Dream Theater. 
Um, but the the live shows that you you're going to do, which again are on the website, and um, and I'll hound you about a couple of these other things because um, there's so much music there that that the world needs to hear again, like for real. I believe I, I mean I'm I'm genuine about that. There's some of those records that are are criminally under um, under acknowledged. Thanks, buddy. They can listen to those records while they're reading your books. There you go. Uh, but, and your your <laughs> website. The listeners out there, you should just definitely Google Peter in the uh, in the book world, and you'll discover. Especially if you're a reader, I know James is a tremendous fan. Yeah, your, James uh, became a big fan. Your, during I always see him on the tour bus, and he's got the tremendous book with you, <laughs> and you're the author, and he's like, "Yes, this book is so good." Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The book you wrote for me is very small, but it's also really an awesome read. I'm not a big reader. I, I you know. I know you're mad at me for that, but um, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but I read the Wired for Madness book very quickly because it really got. I probably I would get through the other ones too, but no, that one got me. And I sat there and I read the whole thing. I was like, wow, I really enjoyed that. That's awesome. It was fun. I got to go some really like crazy places because of the concept you gave me to write about. So it was fun. Yeah, yeah, right. right. One of these days you'll write a size book, the kind that James has been. Uh, you know, taking on the butt. I don't know. I think he uses those to work out with too. <laughs> the kind of big, heavy. they call them door stoppers. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Anyway, great to see you. Listen, good luck with the show. You You're too. an awesome uh, interviewer. I'm sure you'll do really well. I'm excited about your going on this new adventure and yeah. uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, man. You take care. Great. Bye, Bye. Peter.